Hi, Hardies. I'm Jelsey from Puerto Rico, and I am so happy to welcome you to Heart to Hardies, our chat or chats with the casting crew of When Close a Heart. I'm joined today by my friends. Annette from South Carolina. And Lori from Mobile, Alabama. And we are so very happy to have with us the writer who wrote Sunday's episode, episode six, titled The Heart of the Problem, Allie Devereaux. Yay! Yay. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you for having me back. I mean, I'm, I'm, I got to double hit this year to be on Heart to Hardy's Toys. So thank you guys. <laughs> I like, I really have so much fun on here. So I'm really happy to be back. Yay. We're glad. Yeah. We're, we're super glad to have you. And to start us off, so there were a lot of amazing moments in this episode. And for example, we had a lot of time with like the Hope Valley kids. We got Lucas and Elizabeth and Harmony. We got a community barbecue. And of course, baby Coulter. Finally, we got to know her first name. So tell us about the choice to go with Marigold, with, with Goldie, because Lee's alternatives, although they were family members' names, you know, Gussie and Dipple, yeah, that they were just not great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, of course, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about what baby Coulter's name was going to be. It was a lot. We spent a lot of time in the room because uh, especially after we sort of established the storyline and knew it was going to be Rosemary's mother's name, we needed a name that could fit that person as well as fit who we know Goldie to be. Um, so we just knew it had to be kind of a bit larger than life. Um, so a lot of names were tossed around. We had a couple that we even tried out where we put them on the board, tried them around. Um, but it was Lindsay Sturman, who's our new showrunner this season to season 10. Um, and she really loved Goldie. Goldie's a family name of hers. So she brought it to us and that kind of got the ball rolling. We had always talked with connecting Rosemary since Rosemary is kind of a, a floral kind of um, a plant name, um, botanical name. We really wanted that type type of name as well so when Goldie came we thought Marigold with the nickname Goldie and that's kind of how that name came to be um and then there was also some beautiful Marigolds just planted behind the Coulter I think you can see them in some of the um, episodes behind the Coulter um the offices so you can there's Marigolds planted there as well um as for Gussie and Dimple some of the other names um it's funny because that actually from um, back in season nine when we were first breaking the story of Rosemary's pregnancy um, I was working on a different storyline and I had to do some research for some popular names of the 1800s late 1800s and I guess Dimple was actually pretty popular back then mm. um, so <laughs> we were talking about Rosemary and Lee having this new baby and jokingly I was like what about Dimple Coulter because <laughs> it's such a <laughs> mouthful um, and it was kind of this joke that we referred to the baby as Dimple for a while. And so when we were breaking this episode, I'm like, I'm just going to throw it in. I have to find a way to put it in there. So that's why she was Dimple for one second, because a lasting joke. Yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. We yeah. have to be looking for those marigolds next episode. Yeah. yeah. Well, before we turn our attention to your marvelous episode, can you indulge us with one more general question? Little Jack has been asking about his daddy and Elizabeth mentioning him again on Sunday spurred a lot of speculation among Hardys. Francis Kennedy of Lynn, Massachusetts asked, will you be bringing Jack back into the series? Well, I get the desire, Francis, because it was such a beautiful love story between Elizabeth and Jack. And, you know, it was cut so short. Like we saw them just married. So totally, you know, I get it. I get wanting to see them, but that's kind of life. Sometimes we really lose great people in our lives. And um, when we talk about Jack, we're kind of thinking, you know, back in the early days, um, season one, you know, we had Abigail talking about Noah so much. And I don't know about you guys, but when I was watching it, when I watched it back and, and just hearing about Noah, Noah felt like a full character to me. When I think about Noah and I think about everything Abigail sort of brought when she talked about him, I think of him like a full character, even though we never really met him on screen. Um, and she just kept him alive with her love. 
And it was really strong always with Abigail. So um, I think it's kind of beautiful that we see Elizabeth is doing that with Jack. She's keeping him alive with her love and little Jack's love too. So um, even though we don't see him, he's just, he'll keep being mentioned and he's going to continue to be a huge part of Elizabeth's life. Um, but I think now it's in that way. Yeah. As much Thank as you. I wish we could see Jack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that answers sense. a lot of Hardy's questions. It makes yeah. sense too. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Well, in last week's episode, Leanne Michelle from Nashville, Tennessee, noticed that little Jack repeated the way Rosemary said Ben when she said the happiest I've ever been. She said Bean. And he repeated that. So Leanne says, I've personally always thought that Pascal had a fun way of saying that word. So I'm curious if it was in the script or was it one of Highland's antics? Um, him repeating it, Leanne's on the money, that it came from Highland. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, and I, I think that's actually one of the best things that comes with like working with the young kid actors. I think Neil talked about it a little bit in his chat too, about how they shoot the master and the close up of little yes. kids together usually to sort of catch them. Um, but it's like kids are always in a sense of play. So when you're working with really young actors, they're ready to play. And um, then you get kind of get these awesome moments because they're so good at improv because they're constantly playing. But the funny thing about the bean thing versus bin is that's like a Western Canadian accent thing. So you're just hearing Pascal's accent. And I think it's yeah. really funny. Sometimes her accent comes out a little stronger. And it's funny that even Highlands commented on it. So it's just, she's a real prairie woman with that bean. <laughs> yeah. And I, in that, also that moment, uh, I feel like Pascal then had to improvise as well. And mm -hmm. like, she did. you know, follow him <laughs> like bean. And like, and like mm -hmm. it's, it was so natural. Like if it was in the script. Yeah, it just, it well, it, because it felt like it was really them. It was really the characters. And yeah. I think that's the awesome thing. Our actors, all of the actors on our show are fantastic at improv. So we get some really great moments that way too. There's this very, very sweet, almost sweet, genuine moment is what it felt like. Yeah. Well, we loved talking to director Neil Fernley last week, who directed both episodes five and six. So how is it working with such a seasoned Wind Calls the Heart director? And tell us about the talks you have with him to establish your vision for Sunday's episode. Yeah, so I feel really lucky. Um, I think it was uh, Paul Redford who said, uh, when, when talking about our directors, we have an embarrassment of riches on this show. We have some really great um, directors that have come through and Neil's been on the show since season one so he really is just um, the real deal when it comes to when calls the heart um, fun fact too is um, Neil directed my first episode back in season nine as well um, and he was there for my first day on set so he kind of gave me the lay of the land of Hope Valley for the first day of my first episode on the show so it's fun that I've you know I've gotten to work with Neil a few times now um, and as for talks of the vision of the show that we have a whole whack of meetings always before when we're in prep, we do, you know, usually they're on zoom. Now they used to be in the production office, but um, it's the director at the helm. So Neil for these two episodes and production team writers, Ayla who wrote episode five and I got to join our showrunners there. All the creative um, department heads are there and we all come together and they talk everything from concept, tone, props, even background performers and music, all of that stuff comes out in these kind of prep, uh, meetings where we all kind of collaborate so everybody's talking together about what they see what they're picturing sometimes script changes come in these meetings because we're talking and things we get inspired or somebody has a different vision and we're like oh that's so that's different than what we saw but that's so much better so you know when they you know the saying it takes a village that completely applies to tv shows too so we're all coming together and just it's really collaborative right from the start and a, a director like Neil will come in and, and he kind of captains that. So he can the production side with the writing side and the acting side as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. it, yeah. Like leading the way with that. And I yeah. feel like it shows like definitely. Mm -hmm. It's we are so lucky. Like our, the crew on this show is just so great. Like every time I'm in these meetings and I'm just like, Barbara's talking about costumes and I'm like, oh my gosh, I could listen to her talk about costumes for three hours. Like I just, she's showing things and I'm just like, I don't know anything about costumes, but it's all amazing. <laughs> so, it is. Yeah. 
And after talking with y'all, it sounds like it's such a labor of love for all of you. Yeah. And it's, a, well, it's almost like it's a gift to us hearties, how much love you guys put into this show. It, it is, every, I feel like everyone that's on the show loves the show. And that's yes. why we have people that have worked on the show for years and years. People like Neil that have been on since season one or Peter who's been on since season two and Derek who's been on since season two. People come on the show and they just sort of stay. Yes. Um, and that doesn't always happen with film. So it, it really is a testament to how great the show is. We are blessed. Yeah. Well, so along, we. those same, along those same time lines of being blessed, it was such a small moment in the episode, such a quick line, but uh, it, it might be easily overlooked, but I really love that Minnie's first instinct going over the books and all the profits were up, that her first instinct was to give it back to Hope Valley, to make that community barbecue. That was just such a wonderful thought of hers. Now, Neil Fernley told us that the shoot of that entire outdoor dinner came together in one day ahead of a storm. They kind of had a deadline going there. I can't help but think that Minnie's goodwill may have had something to do with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, of course, the Canfields, like it, it just feels like there wouldn't be any other way that they would do this. Um, but it's a really special moment that we get to see them kind of highlight. They're able to highlight their love of Hope Valley and the fact that they've really found a home there. We get to see it with the Canfields because a lot of our characters have kind of been in town for a long time, whereas arguably the Canfields are a little newer in town. So we get to still really see this love that they're growing as it's really becoming their home and they know it's their forever home. Um, so I just think that's really, really special. And it kind of came together in this barbecue. However, the barbecue scene itself, I know was a huge undertaking for production. Um, and you can't tell from looking at it because the production team and the post-production team did an incredible job, but it, they were also on top of the storm that's coming after they were dealing with wildfire smoke during residual smoke. So they cleaned it up. It looks much less apocalyptic than it did in the dailies <laughs> when, we when they were filming it. Um, but yeah, so uh, obviously they were happy that rain was coming, but because rain was coming, they either had smoke or rain and they're like, guess it's going to be smoky. Um, but it doesn't look that way because kind of like Hope Valley, Wang calls the heart, they have a way of achieving miracles. So you'd never know. Um, kind of the pressure that was on them to get the shots needed for that scene but it came together so beautifully and um yeah I just think it was a lot of people's will of love just to get that scene together and a lot of hard work from the production team so not a small thing that they that they accomplished that especially in one day <laughs> oh I know and that was I love that barbecue and speaking of it I'm from the south so we love our barbecues so what did you learn about the Missouri barbecue? Because I don't know a whole lot being from Alabama. I don't know a whole lot about Missouri barbecue. Um, but we, I, I can tell you this, that that stack of cornbread she had and the way uh, Florence and jo and Molly, I'm having trouble with names today. I was forgetting students' names. Florence and Molly love Joseph's sauce. So what can you tell us about Missouri barbecue? Well, I have to say, um, as a Canadian, I didn't know much before <laughs> starting on the episode, um, but it actually came from Ayla Glass, who wrote um, episode five, the previous episode. Mm -hmm. She's from Kansas City, so she ah. schooled me on it. And then Paul Redford was born in Edmonton, but was raised in Kansas as well. And so he also, they both of them talked a lot about barbecue and differences in barbecue. And we spent a lot of time talking about it. And I was always hungry. And they're telling me all sorts of stuff about sauce and my stomach's grumbling. Um, so definitely what I learned from that is that I need to go to Missouri and get some barbecue because yeah. it sounds amazing. <laughs> I really wanted to be on set that day when they were making it, but I didn't get to be on set. But I really wanted to. I watched all the dailies and was like, some of that barbecue, it looks so good. Um and it was apparently it was really good. They did eat it, so there's a they Ooh. they made some oh, good barbecue. It. it was the our caterers from the uh -huh. uh, from the set. They catered also the barbecue, so it was real barbecue. They had oh, barbecue good. that day as well. Hi, <laughs> everybody got to enjoy the Missouri barbecue. Everybody got to yeah. yeah. And then at home we were just like, I was like, make sure you get I told all my family before they watch and like have something to eat because they're gonna have to talk about really good food on this and this episode. <laughs> 
Yeah, I felt like I was like, hey, that sounds like fun. I would totally go to a Hope Valley barbecue. Everything looks so good. Minnie's cooking. Yeah, I mean, I would totally sit there and eat. I think, you know, we're just, they're going to have to update the, the cookbook now with some of Minnie's recipes. There you go. And yeah. they got to have those feuding sauces. Minnie's and oh, Joe's. sauces. Let people try them and then mix them. See how they taste yep. together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, but Bill said the mixing them was the best. So, <laughs> so um, also, you know, we have had a few characters as blatantly and comically annoying as Mr. Mitchell, the tourist. So he was calling the kids miscreants. And so did you crack yourself up writing these scenes? Um. He- uh, yeah, Edwin Mitchell is real was really fun to write. He kind of came from some of my memories of being a child at like church gatherings because I have two siblings and I'd be running around and there's always people that are like, settle down, like this is not for playing. <laughs> so it's a little combination of that. It was, it was kind of inspiring as it was as I was writing him. But um, you know, it's a, in in kind of the same way as I was talking about Madeline. He's not very Hope Valley. He doesn't come from Hope Valley. So he's allowed to be a little more obnoxious and over the top than our town residents usually are because they have the neighborly Hope Valley way that he doesn't have. So he's extra fun to write because he can be obnoxious in this way because he hasn't learned that he's starting. We see him come around a little at the end, but at the start, he really didn't get what it's like in Hope Valley and the kids teach him. They tell him this is how it is in Hope Valley. He comes around, Um, but that made him really fun to write. So, and I also kind of like that he was an adversary for the, ad, sorry, an adversary for the kids because we don't always get to see the kids on their own storylines. Mm-hmm. In this episode, we kind of got to, they're growing, they're getting a bit older, so they can kind of start to hold some of these stories themselves. Yeah. And um, it was really fun to kind of see them and, and write for them when they're doing scenes on their own as well. They're writing, they have their own. They want to prove it to him. So he got yeah. to be sort of an antagonist just for the kids. Because he's really not antagonizing anyone else, just the kids. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Can I say, as a teacher, I loved that you had it, or Elizabeth told the kids they had to figure it out on their own. Mm-hmm. They had because they're getting it. old enough. Yeah. I loved that. Instead of telling them, why don't you try this? She and Lucas kind of pushed him in the right direction. And I love that you did it that way. Yeah, she didn't step in too much. I think that's the fun part with Elizabeth is that she, we, that's what makes her, I think, a really good teacher. My dad's a teacher. Um, so I always love writing the, the teacher scenes. And it's about guiding them instead of just schooling them. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. And just out of curiosity, like, um, is there a difference, like, for you in your process of, like, writing for the kids and then writing for the adults? For me, it, it really just depends on the character. Like each character kind of has their own voice. And sometimes with like new characters, like Toby's new this season. So we kind of get to play and explore a little bit with him, especially in our first drafts so or in the writer's room. We ca- we get to talk about him and establish him. And then we ca- with characters that are established, like um, the Canfield kids or Allie, they're growing. So then we're like, well, where have they, what have they been through the last year? Like, we're seeing they, they're growing so much because that's how kids are. Like they grow fast. So we're taking all the experience we've seen them in and applying that and being like, well, what what have they learned so far? So you kind of get to just really reflect a lot with writing the kids. Um, and I, I find that really fun when you when we sit down to write kids scenes. And I, I mean, I love just even the scenes of them sitting in the booth now. They get to have their own conversations where they're like, these are our problems and we're dealing with them because they're the future of Hope Valley. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Like to keep that perspective, depending on which character you're writing for. Um, And so in this episode as well, like we're back to like an ease between Elizabeth and Lucas. Um, And he may think he doesn't have like a lot of experience with kids, but he really gave them an important life lesson about finding a compromise. So why was this important to the writer's room? So um, we, in in our room, we always take a lot of care when we talk about like the school lessons, um, because usually when we are able to have a school scene, that's the theme of the episode. What Elizabeth's teaching is usually going to be what the theme of the episode is. Um, And so for this, 
episode, it's kind of getting to the root of the problem. And that is seen also in even Rosemary's storyline with her mom. She's trying to figure out what is causing her this, this sadness, this pain, just getting to the root of all issues. Um, but as for Lucas, we're kind of seeing more of this season. We, we saw it a little bit in episode three, just more of him kind of growing and, you know, just showing him being able to use his past, all his skills, what he learned as a gambler and doing it this Hope Valley way. And so we're just trying to use these storylines to build on that and just kind of show his growth and his importance in the community where we're seeing that he's realizing. Like, so it's, it's kind of like you said, he, at first he doesn't see it. And then he is put in these situations, he shows it because there's a part of him that thinks maybe his past, he can't have his past in Hope Valley and be this guy, this new guy, but it's all part of him. And so now he's really seeing how every part of him um, is important to Hope Valley and he has a place there. Um, to kind of help the community. And so that's just going to continue throughout the rest of the season for Lucas in a really interesting way, I think. That's very interesting. Well, last night, I mean, uh, Sunday night, we were treated to some of the most painful and yet beautiful moments with Rosemary's grief storyline. What a scene with Andrea Brooks and Pascal. And what a breathtaking line. I've never had more love inside me, but I've never felt so afraid. Did you write this and tell us how the idea of a motherless mother came about? Yeah, that scene with Pascal and Andrea, it was, it's so beautiful. Like it makes me cry every time I watch it from the first time I watched the dailies to even just watching it on Sunday night. Um, I just think, you know, there's, yeah, there's so much there and they play it so beautifully. That scene and the scene where Rosemary is talking to Elizabeth about her mother's letters. Both those two scenes make me cry each time. Um, as for that line, it's definitely a team effort when we're writing. So I can't even be sure exactly where the line came from. I think maybe I wrote it if I'm remembering it right. But even if I did, um, it's completely inspired by the conversations that we have as a room, especially um, with Lindsay and Beth Stewart, um, who you guys interviewed, and she wrote episode four and a, another episode th uh, this season. And they're both mothers themselves. So they really were very vulnerable with us and told us a lot about early motherhood. I'm not a mother, so um, it's not something that I know from experience, but they were really open with me and shared a lot with me. Um, and I'm so grateful um, just to hear about it my sister is a mother and I know a lot of what she went through and she talked to me, but just hearing all these different experiences from mothers about what they go through, it's just, there's so much. Um, so we really wanted to be able to show that because yes, there's a lot of joy in early motherhood, but there's a lot of other emotions too. Um, so that was the, the main thing we really wanted to show with this storyline. Um, especially because we usually do see Rosemary so larger than life and everything's grand. Um, so it's nice to kind of see her on this other more vulnerable like layer. Um, Lindsay is the one who brought up the motherless mother. Um, we decided in, in the room, sort of the backstory early in the season of what we wanted Rosemary's mother's storyline to be and sort of how we wanted that to have been, you know, that Rosemary's mother left when she was quite young and sort of that idea. Um, and um, Lindsay then brought up, you know, a concept that she had learned, which was motherless mothers. And when she discovered this, it kind of changed the way she looked at motherhood herself. It's really beautiful, her story. So um, I want to allow her to share it when she has time to join you, because she definitely has a really personal connection, with the motherless mothers. And she shared a lot of that with our room and she's quite open about it. So um, yeah, I hope she can, when she finally can join you, she'll be able to share that with you guys. Um, but yeah, just, um, I'm so grateful that I got to write this storyline and that my um, room, the mothers in our room were so open about their own experiences and just helping me really bring it to life. And then once I was done my drafts, the, the room takes the draft. So everyone came in together and sort of put their own emotions into it. And when it's a scene that's really emotional like that, every person puts a little bit of themselves in it. So um, that's how a scene like that comes. It's really another village for sure. I will well, it was say perfect. That, I will say that when we chatted with Pascal, we had the opportunity to chat 
chat with Pascal early in the season and before the actor strike and everything. And she kind of teased us that there was going to be a storyline that was going to be different that she didn't think it had ever been covered before. Mm -hmm. And so some of us were like, what could that be? What could they be? Y'all hit it out of the park. That was yes. amazing. I was not yes. expecting that. And it was beautiful. I, I was in tears too. Well, it's a, it's a concept that I, I don't think is seen. Mm -hmm. Lindsay was really felt really strongly about it because, you know, it's not something we see on screen a lot, but it is something that a lot of people can relate to. Um, and yeah, I just, I, it was, she, yeah, she really championed it. And I'm so glad that we got to show it because I do think that hearing other people talk about it, um, just helps people realize that it's something that other people go through. It's a real thing. Um, yeah. Yes. Good. And a lot of Hardys were sharing their personal experiences on Facebook. And that was really nice to see. Well, on another subject, Pastor Joseph, he was everywhere last night. He was ministering to Elizabeth and Lee as they tried to help Rosemary. He was checking in on Henry and his wife caught him brushing off sawdust as he rushed from the mill to the church. How long can he keep up this pace? Not long, I have to say, you know, no one can, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're really, we're starting to see this episode kind of hinting at the fact that, you know, maybe he's stretching himself a little thin. And in the coming episodes, the um, episodes coming up, you're, you're really going to see that even Joseph, um, you know, who is a jack of all trades and can do anything, <laughs> he can't do everything at once. He can do anything, but he can't do everything. Um, so this is just sort of the start of him realizing he doesn't have to do it all and he can figure out what it is he wants to do. Um, so it's going to start a little bit of a, a nice little arc for him. Um, in the coming episode yeah. yeah but he won't don't worry he won't be exhausted forever <laughs> <laughs> but I, I feel like um one calls a heart tackles a lot of like real life topics and I feel like this is one like Joseph's right now that people can relate to and can identify with like oh my gosh like maybe I'm spreading myself too thin like so I love that that um one calls a heart you know tackles different things that you can like identify with and it's always been like that which I appreciate yes yeah I, we talk about you know you know we want to we want to take on hard issues but we want to give them a soft place to land so that people when we're experiencing this you know you want to see it in a way because life is hard in a lot of ways and um it's nice to see other people kind of dealing with things you're dealing with but you don't want to re-traumatize yourself so the show always tries to treat these real world issues in a soft way if we can. Yeah. It shows. And it's <laughs> I love I love that. I love that. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears here and talk a little bit about Nathan. Emily Estes from Huntsville, Alabama asks, in episode six, we see Nathan take a leap of faith, pun intended, and ask Faith to dance with him. How does this moment jumpstart a newfound confidence in Nathan regarding his romantic life for the rest of season 10? So I think like, I thought it was really fun kind of seeing Nathan and Faith sort of figuring out, like they start on, they're always on different sides. They're like swinging on two sides um, as they're trying to figure out where they stand with each other. Um, and we saw them dance. And I think now the next step is to kind of hear them really articulate where they think they stand, what they want. Um, and I just, you know, they're, they're still figuring out how they feel about each other. And um, we're going to see them vocalize what that looks like and what that means and how they feel. Um, so as it continues and we sort of see them sorting that out, I think it's going to become clearer, hopefully, what Nathan wants. Hopefully clearer to both Nathan himself and the Hardys. Um, so we have that to think about coming forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, keeping keeping on Nathan, he made two decisive mo moves in this episode, one inviting Faith to dance with him, and the other interviewing Harry the Bandit about how the Union City Holding Company is buying up surrounding farmland. Teresa McLaughlin of Powhatan, Virginia, wonders, what are the main themes being explored in Nathan's story in season 10, and which storyline will be the most significant, Faith? Or the investigation. So I think um, 
it's kind of all connected in a way because I think, you know, the main theme for Nathan this season is letting people in, you know? So we see it with Faith. We see it with Scout. We even see it with Bill, you know, in some of the scenes where we see Bill and Nathan talking about, you know, how they feel. We even, you know, last night we saw, you know, Nathan and Bill talking about how Bill feels about Madeline. So I think that's kind of the continuing theme is just seeing Nathan because a lot of time we we see Nathan, you know, he's a little more to himself about how he feels. So this, the theme of the season is to see him um, kind of letting people in. The most significant story for Nathan is still to come in the later half of the season. Let's tease that. Um, but I can also tease that the investigation side of things kind of bring Nathan into a situation that I don't think we've seen him in before. Um, so it's exciting, hopefully a little thrilling. Um, uh-huh. So we have that kind of some bounty fun, fun in quotation. <laughs> oh, to look forward to. oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, fans like Teresa, I think that are wanting to see more of Nathan kind of working as a Mountie and doing some investigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, keep an extra eye on episode nine. That's all I can say. Ooh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and you said it was all interconnected. That brings back what Beth Stewart said. Mm-hmm. When she was on here, that everything is all connected. I feel like I need to get post-it notes out and start <laughs> little notes up, start trying to connect it. Put it on the wall, like okay. I know. Look, it's it's like I told her a mystery. Put start putting yeah. stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit. You've said you love bringing family history into the wind calls the heart stories, and there's so much of that in this episode. Share with us what each of those meant to you, be it Minnie and Joe's family recipes or Rosemary's trunk full of letters and mementos. Yeah, I I do love the family history stuff and I like learning more about the characters. I think it's really cool that, you know, One Calls is in its 10th season and 11th season that we're writing now, but um, there's still room to learn about characters, even characters like Rosemary that we've known since season one. And that's so fun for us as writers and for, as filmmakers and I think as actors and hopefully for Hardy as viewers as well to kind of learn about these characters. Um, I was so excited about Rosemary's family history because as Hardy, just as a viewer, you know, I've always wanted to know about where Rosemary came from. We know a little bit, you know, she shared that her dad was a Mountie and that's how she met Jack. Like we hear a little bit, but not that much. And for someone who talks a lot about themselves, <laughs> like Rosemary does in the best way. Um, It's so interesting that she doesn't share that much about her family. So when we were breaking the season, I was like, we need to know about Rosemary's mother because Mm. she doesn't talk about her. So um, especially because this season is the season where um, Rosemary becomes a mother herself. So I was really excited that we got to explore that. Um, And then the Canfields, we're also learning more about them as well. We get to, we're just getting to know them in the best way. We're seeing these deeper parts of them. Um, and, you know, we've spent a little bit of time talking about some of the places they've lived. And um, we saw, um, we had a storyline where Minnie and Angela were away. We know they went to visit family. So they, you know, they have people around, but we just wanted to expand their backstory in, in a really fun way. And, and that's how the idea of the barbecue was born. And with the little competition of, you know, barbecue sauce, we get to see you know, Minnie and Joseph have fun together, be a little flirty as, you know, they still have fun, even though they've been married for a long time. We still see them being a little flirty and fun. Uh, so, well, everything, that everything, and Joseph, every time. <laughs> so why was that mingling of St. Louis, Kansas City and Hope Valley emphasized during this episode? There's something there? Yeah, so I mean, the Campbells are so part of the community like we can't picture Hope Valley without them um so we found the barbecue was going to be like a fun kind of visual way to show that their worlds have come full circle Hope Valley is totally their home but they don't forget where they came from either so one of the amazing things about Hope Valley is that everyone that comes to Hope Valley brings everything with them they bring their past with them they bring it to Hope Valley Hope Valley embraces them and embraces all of it so every part of them, even where you come from, becomes part of Hope Valley too. And so this was a really good, fun, visual way to sort of show that and show that they are completely in Hope Valley. All of them, their past, everything is part of Hope Valley. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
<laughs> I love that. That's 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 very touching. I really do. I love that. <laughs> but so again, a safe place to land is one. Well, it's true about all of them. You're right. It's true about all the characters. And I think back, I love that. Yeah, that's and true. we were like, let's have a barbecue to show that because what mm -hmm. better way than a bunch of yummy food <laughs> mm -hmm. and everybody coming together? I like that. Yeah, and um, I gotta say, there were a lot of like these little moments to rewatch in this episode, like Elizabeth, you know, nailing that beanbag toss, um, and like Toby splashing Mr. Mitchell, um, the faces of everybody but like the faces of the men when lee introduces his daughter you know by her official name uh so what moment do you think the viewers will be you know compelled to rewatch? i mean that's part of the fun of having a cast that's as big and as talented as our cast um because every time you watch it and every time i watch it i notice something new and i have rewatched the series many times through um updating the bible and just before i watched before I start the new season, I always rewatch again just to kind of keep it fresh. So I think I've watched this this series like fourteen times, maybe. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. I, you know, and I always notice new things every time I watch it because each person is always doing something else. Um, but it's usually the comedy that I notice second when I first watch episodes and I first watch the cuts. I'm usually tracking dramatic story logic and um, just following. What the story is and then the second time around is when i really notice the comedic beats and there's you know i just find myself cracking up because there's comedic delivery there's little improv lines and um sometimes just the delivery of the line makes me laugh like it was scripted but the way kevin deadpan deliveries you're walking around the dark ask me if i can fix your porch <laughs> it was just really funny it made me laugh every time i watched it um and just little moments like that. Oh, and then um, I love the way Elizabeth throws the sandbag. Because it's actually sand. It was sand back then. They didn't yeah. use beanbags. It was sand. Um, she throws a sandbag behind her. And I think in the script, it was like something like effortlessly or expertly. Mm -hmm. That's all it said. She just tosses it expertly or something. The throwing it behind her back, like that, all Aaron. So we watched it. And it was just awesome. Little uh -huh. surprise. So there's always little moments. I'm like, I'm. sometimes you got to watch the episode and just just watch elizabeth and then watch the episode and just watch nathan and then watch the episode and just watch lucas and you'll notice new things because the cast is so incredible and the director is so incredible and everyone's just coming together and bringing all these awesome little moments so even when you've watched it many times i still enjoy the rewatch right that's true that's very true um because I enjoy it too, like all the whenever I rewatch, it's like noticing those little things the second time around. Um, yeah. So should we expect um, that the theme, you know, of negotiation and arriving at win-wins will enter into Lucas and Elizabeth's relationship as, you know, they move, they move forward this season? Yeah, we get to see Elizabeth and Lucas grow a lot this season, and, and especially in the later half. Um, there's outside forces that kind of come together and sort of make everyone in town, you know, they're sort of forced to rally together for the good of Hope Valley. We're going to see some of that coming up. Um, and Elizabeth and Lucas are front and center because, you know, they're really pillars of Hope Valley. And um, because of that, we see them needing to use these skills. Like we see this, this, the, these skills in a smaller scale in this episode, like, you know, what they're teaching the kids about tourists just a lot more tourists but um come later in the season we're going to see much bigger scale um problems but the same kind of um tactics are needed to face these problems so we'll definitely see them face them problems head on towards the end um and using some of the skills that they sort of touch on in this episode and that's about all i can say without giving the storyline away but when you know the storyline you'll understand what i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah okay yeah well coming up in episode seven we see the promo and we learn that rosaline molly's daughter returns to town mm 
but it looks like she'll have some interaction with Henry, the man who bears responsibility for the death of her father and so many of the miners. So what can we expect when these two come face to face? Yeah, so we haven't seen Rosaline in a, in a long time, like since season two. So, you know, we have a lot of catching up to do with her because it's been a, a while since we saw her, but we were so excited to have her back. Like, I'm yeah. so excited that she's back this season and we can see her grown up. Um, the trauma of her past, especially her dad's death, because she was so young during the mine explosion, we're, it's definitely still weighing on her. We see that it is. Um, and unfortunately, Gowan serves as a painful reminder for her of that um, because he was so front and center um, with the mining company. So that's what she sees. But for the same reason, she kind of serves as a painful reminder of Gowan's guilt that he's carrying. So we saw him sort of starting to heal a bit and kind of put the guilt aside. And then here comes Rosaline, who just represents that huge guilt that he feels and what he feels, you know, is his biggest regrets. So they bring up a lot of emotions for each other. But because of that, and in the full Hope Valley way, they kind of can teach each other something so we're going to see a little bit of them and how healing can happen together in a way um i think it's a really special story i'm so excited about it and we like to say that this story is for the fans that have been with the show since season one this is the 10 years in the making story um and yeah it's just that just the little gift for those hardies that have been there since you know rosalie ran into the mine in episode three for those that were calling for here where is she when mm -hmm. elizabeth goes to find her and she comes running the that's this storyline is for them for those people who have been there since then yeah. i could oh, say in you. the facebook group we get all the time we get people saying rosaline we miss rosaline molly's still there where's rosaline we keep getting that so thank you that's that's one of my top when calls the heart that episode three that's one of my top yes. ones i can't wait to see what y'all do here it, yeah. it's, I mean, it's a powerful episode for me. Um, when I was interviewing for this job, for this show, I, I knew with the show, I hadn't seen the show prior to getting the interview. That's how I discovered the show. And so I sat down before I was like, let's see if you know, I'm going to want to go for the show. I watched the episode and I got to episode three and I was like, okay, I'm doing it. This show is something. That episode was like a shift for me that I was like, wow, this is really a really special show. Um, I think wow. it's just, yeah, such a powerful episode. So I was really excited to have her back for sure. Yeah. I have to say that when I saw that preview and that last moment of the preview where they're just standing in front of each other, I literally got chills because I know like, you know, the weight of that moment, like it's, yeah. it's heavy, you know, what she feels. And like you said, like now she's a reminder of that guilt that he felt that he was now you know starting to you know put to the side and um and yeah so I'm I'm excited to to see that mm -hmm. episode oh my goodness it's, it's gonna be great can't wait to yeah. watch that Sunday night thank you Allie you have created such moving and funny moments in this episode and can't wait to see what comes up next we are so honored to hear your insights on this past episode thank you so much for joining us today Thank you for having me back. You. Yeah, you know, I really love these chats. I love talking with you guys. I love watching them. I watch all the chats. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I'm just really grateful to be back talking with you guys. And uh, especially because, you know, I had so much fun writing this episode. It was such a highlight for me. I am so excited um, with it and to be a part of it. And so I'm just, yeah, I'm really happy to be here talking to you guys. And thank you for having me back. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Hardys, for coming through week after week with these really strong summer ratings. Y'all have been great. Every tweet you write with the hashtag Hardys contributes to the ratings. And we hope you will follow, like, and comment on our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of these chats. See you next time on Heart to Hardys. Bye-bye. <laughs>